ramifications of the Stone Ridge case. Uh, moderating this panel will be my colleague, uh, Craig Boyce, who's associate professor and also associate director of the Center for Business Law and Regulation. Prior to joining the faculty here at, at Case, he uh, served uh, in private practice for eight years at firms including Cleary Gottlieb, Aiken Gump in New York, and Thompson Hine here in Cleveland. Uh, he uh, specializes and focuses on taxation issues and has actually written an article looking at uh, some of the tax implications of cases like Enron and, and how uh, earnings and other issues are reported. Uh, and with no further ado, I'll turn this over to Craig Boyce, who will moderate this panel. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, as Jonathan said, the, the, uh, the second panel is going to take a little bit different approach uh, to the Stone Ridge issue. Uh, we're going to shift our focus a bit and examine this case um, uh, in the broader context of securities regulation policy and some of the policy concerns. Um, uh, the arguments made in this case, the Supreme Court's decision ultimately will um, uh, be played out against the backdrop of our larger shared interest in preserving the integrity of the securities markets. Uh, to that end, uh, on this panel we'll hear from um, three different speakers. I'll introduce them uh, briefly uh, in the order that we'll hear from them. Uh, our first speaker is um, James Copeland. He's director of the Manhattan Institute's Center for Legal Policy, uh, which seeks to communicate thoughtful ideas on civil justice reform um, to the real decision makers. Um, Mr. Copeland also serves as managing editor of the Institute's pointoflaw.com, which is a web magazine, uh, and he's project manager for the Institute's Trial Lawyers, um, Inc. series of publications. Uh, he's published uh, opinion columns in national, local, and online newspapers, including the Wall Street Journal, the National Law Journal, Investors Business Daily, and the National Review Online. Has appeared on a variety of television and radio shows, including MSNBC, CNBC, C-SPAN, and NPR. Before joining uh, the Manhattan Institute, he was a uh, management consultant with McKinsey and Company in New York. He served uh, as a law clerk to the Honorable Ralph K. Wender on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, and. Um, uh, on, on the private side has been a director of two privately um, held manufacturing companies uh, in the last 10 years. He received his JD and, and um, MBA degrees from Yale where he was an Olin Fellow in Law and Economics and an editor of the Yale Journal on Regulation. Um, he will be followed by um, Andrea Seit who is uh, Deputy Chief Counsel in the Office of the Ohio Attorney General uh, Mark Dan. Um, what brings her to this case is her specialization in managing complex uh, litigation matters that are of special interest to the Office um, of the Attorney General and to the State of Ohio, including representation of state uh, pension funds as lead plaintiffs in federal securities um, uh, class actions. Uh, prior to uh, her, her time with the state, she was a litigator uh, for Jones Day in the Columbus, Ohio office. Uh, where she represented cl mostly corporate clients in complex litigation matters, both at the trial and appellate levels, uh, in actions involving products liability, uh, bankruptcy, uh, elections, environmental law, tax, which is uh, near and dear to my heart. And um, um, prior to that, she received her um, law degree and undergrad degree from um, Ohio State University. Finally, um, Rounding out this panel, uh, we'll hear from um, Professor Stephen Bainbridge, who is the William D. Warren Professor of Law at UCLA, um, where he teaches business associations, um, uh, corporate finance, securities regulation, other um, similar types of courses. Uh, he hit, prior to um, being at UCLA, he taught at the University of Illinois. Uh, he also has taught at Harvard Law School uh, as the Joseph Flom Visiting Professor of Law and Business uh, at La Trobe University in Melbourne, um, and, and um, has written over 50 law review <coughs> articles in areas related to the topics that we're uh, the topic that we're discussing today, including articles in the Harvard Law Review, Virginia Law Review, Northwestern Re uh, University Law Review, Cornell, and others. Uh, he has a book, uh, casebook, Business Associations, Cases and Materials on Agency, Partnerships, and Corporations. Uh, 
uh, along with a couple of other um, textbooks and treatises um, on, again, securities-related issues. Um, just to remind those of you who are looking uh, at us on the webcast, if you have questions or want to make comments uh, toward the end of this panel, uh, you can submit those by email to Case CBLR, that's Center for Business Law and Regulation, Case CBLR at gmail.com. We're going to begin um, by hearing from Ms. Site, who's going to discuss some policy arguments made in the amicus brief uh, filed in this case by Ohio, Texas, and 30 other um, uh, states in support of the petitioner. Uh, specifically, she's going to talk about what happens if the Supreme Court um, effectively immunizes non-speaking uh, scheme defendants from private securities fraud lawsuits. Um, I'm sorry, I, you're not you're not first. You're second. I can go first if you no, want me to. That, <laughs> that was my my mistake. Um, so that's that's second. What's what's first uh, will be uh, Mr. Copeland, who's going to talk about the impact of the Supreme Court's decision potentially on the competitiveness of um, U.S. capital markets. Uh, and third, um, Professor Bainbridge, who will talk about uh, some of the likely Sarbanes-Oxley implications um, of the Supreme Court's decision. So without further ado, I will give you our speakers. Mr. Copeland. Thank you. Um, yeah, what they've really asked me to talk about is something we've been looking at at the Manhattan Institute over the last year, as have a number of other peoples, and that's uh, what looks to be uh, a, a precarious decline in competitiveness, competitiveness of U.S. capital markets, or at least some aspects of U.S. capital markets. Um, this is often dated uh, to the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. Uh, you've seen dramatic reversals since then. Uh, clearly, securities litigation and other types of litigation play an important role here. Uh, this has been a conclusion drawn by three separate uh, groups that have looked at competitiveness over the past year. Uh, the first, which came out last November, uh, was uh, informally called the Paulson Report. It was sort of called by uh, Secretary of Treasury uh, Hank Paulson and, and led by Hal Scott at Harvard and my friend Glenn Hubbard at Columbia and others, and uh, the, the second uh, was a report authored by my former employer, McKinsey and Company, uh, called by Mayor Michael Bloomberg and Senator Chuck Schumer uh, in New York, uh, really looking at, for New York specifically, what are the capital markets concerns we have uh, and what can we do about it. And then third, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce had a, a broad task force that looked at this issue as well that released a report last March. Uh, we had a, a, a conference in April looking at these issues. Steve was one of the participants. Uh, he also came back to talk to us about Sarbanes-Oxley and his new book in more depth in June. Just yesterday we had Richard Epstein talking about securities litigation and, and in relation to the Stone Ridge case. It's something we're going to continue to look at. <clears throat> so to begin with, I, I really just want to run through some of these numbers. It's important to realize that in terms of initial public offerings, the U.S. exchanges were always the exchanges of choice, the markets of choice worldwide, uh, and that really continued up into the last few years. Then we saw a dramatic reversal. In, in 2004, uh, Europe passed the United States significantly. Uh, the number of IPOs in the U.S. were 236 to 433 in Europe. Uh, in 05, that gap... Uh, the, the, that margin widened to 205 in the U.S. to 603 uh, in Europe, and then that trend was sustained again in, in 2006, uh, where there were 224 IPOs in the U.S. to 651 in Europe. Uh, now, the amount of money raised before 2005, uh, Europe had always had never raised as much money as the U.S. Then, all of a sudden, in 2005, Europe on its exchanges raised 85 percent more dollars than the United States exchanges. Uh, in 06, that trend largely continued. They raised 64 percent more, uh, a total of $40 billion more raised in Europe in 06. Uh, even the Chinese exchanges passed the U.S. in terms of dollar volume in 06, raising $12 billion more. Now, um, <clears throat> to some degree, this erosion in U.S. position is uh, inevitable. And, and uh, 
uh, it's important to realize that a lot of this is driven from IPOs out of home markets uh, and they're choosing to raise money on home markets that are now more mature, that are now broader, that are now deeper, and therefore can function to a significant degree the way the U.S. markets have always functioned. However, uh, when you start looking into the numbers more closely, uh, you find uh, when you look at initial public offerings that are out of home market, in other words, looking at IPOs uh, for European companies uh, that are actually in the U.S., although there weren't any in the last quarter of last year, or U.S. companies that were listing uh, in Europe. There were five in the last quarter of last year. Uh, you see significant movement away from the U.S. market in this uh, key index. The last quarter of last year, uh, for instance, there were nine U.S. out-of-market offerings versus 31 in Europe. Um, similarly, and, and this research has largely focused on Sarbanes-Oxley, but if you look at some of the academic research that Kate Litvak and others have done, you start looking at cross listings uh, and seeing a, a substantial decline uh, in U.S. competitiveness in terms of cross listings, in other words, companies that are cross listing into the U.S. market. And what you're seeing a lot of are, are companies in the U.S., A, either going private, uh, or B, if they're foreign companies, delisting from U.S. exchanges. Uh, litigation is clearly one of the drivers, not just Sarbanes-Oxley, behind this trend. Uh, I was at a competitiveness conference in August at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and one of the uh, lead domestic councils here, or American councils here for Bayer, uh, which recently delisted from the U.S., talked about their litigation phenomenon in the products liability sphere uh, with the recall of Baycall, which really shocked the U.S., uh, shocked the European, rather, uh, decision makers at the top of the company. Eleven percent of their Baycall sales were in the U.S., 98 percent of their tort claims resulting from the Baycall recall were in the U.S., uh, and the, the amount of discovery and deposition uh, expense and time that was, was uh, going toward litigation from the top of the company management uh, was really mind-blowing uh, to, to the, to the uh, leadership of the foreign companies. Now, a couple of caveats here. Uh, I don't want to overstate this claim. It's important to realize that uh, regardless of which exchanges are hosting new capital, at least at this point in time, and this could erode over the long run, but at this point in time, the United States investment banks are dominant in this field. Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, uh, First Boston, uh, et cetera, are driving these deals around the world regardless of where the markets uh, are, are being located. Secondly, uh, at least up until recently, there has still been substantial equity available here in the U.S., uh, for new businesses, for growth businesses. Uh, there's been a large shift towards private markets through 144As and more traditional private equity uh, offerings, really going to uh, institutional high net worth investors as opposed to broad initial public offerings uh, here. Uh, now, now, clearly some of the tax changes being discussed in Congress uh, and some of the recent interest rate trends and uh, credit crunches could affect this private equity market. Uh, and, and so there is some concern there. Similarly, for me, there's concern uh, whenever you start creating a, a, a substantial two-tiered uh, ownership structure, if we were to move to a situation like Italy where uh, we had largely extremely, extremely wealthy people uh, were the main people invested in our major private institutions, it could substantially erode long-term support for uh, our sort of free market capital structure that we've always had through dispersed shareholder owner ownership. Uh, and, and, if, and if we had substantially differing rates of return between private and public markets due to different compositions uh, that were driven by these trends, I think it would be of significant concern. So in other words, I, I, I think that there is clear reason to be worried about uh, the competitiveness of U.S. capital markets. Now, what do we see in terms of securities litigation? Uh, and I want to really talk about it more broadly and then, and then specifically about Stone Ridge. Uh, we've seen a, a substantial drop in uh, securities litigation filings over the last few years. Uh, some of this may be attributable to Sarbanes-Oxley itself. That's certainly what Joe Grunfest at Stanford would assert. Uh, 
Some of it is due to substantial strength in the stock markets, which of course creates fewer opportunities for securities lawsuits. Uh, some of it may be due to the to the implosion, uh, the the indictment uh, of uh, a f of a firm and the all but one of the previous named partners of the firm that dominated over 50 percent of the securities litigation market on the plaintiff side. That being. Uh, the Milberg Weiss firm, all of these trends probably affect the filing data. That being said, in terms of actual dollar volume, uh, it, last year in 2006, uh, there was a 300 percent increase in the actual uh, number of settlements uh, of securities cases going up to $10.6 billion. So it, it, I think it's far from clear that, uh, we, we've, uh, that the securities litigation uh, is, 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 is a, a dead issue. Um, and something we should be particularly focused on. Now, uh, what, I, what I really want to think about uh, or, or urge you to think about is, is the, uh, what does our securities litigation system do in terms of private rights of action? Uh, you, you, those of you who are less familiar with the securities or corporate law, you know, you heard this morning we're talking about you know, 10B, 10B-5, uh, the basics that are, I mean, it's important to realize that 10B of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 does not uh, create a private right of action uh, for, for fraud cases, nor does the regulatory uh, interpretation of that 10B-5. Uh, this was a judicially created private right of action in the 1960s, and as, as uh, some of the commenters this, this morning in the first panel discussed, uh, there's been significant backtracking from that without completely reversing uh, that private right of action decision since then. Um, there are some problems with the current regime. Uh, when you look at a, a normal fraud type situation, it, it's far less clear than, say, physical harm uh, why we have, say, a tort action at all for fraud. If you think about it, if, if I sell you uh, that car with the backward odometer, um, that, that Professor Painter was talking about in the first panel, uh, the, the car still exists, the same amount of money still exists. The only reason you create a private right of action for fraud in the general tort context at all is precisely because if you iterate these decisions, the, these fraudulent behaviors out over and over again, then you reduce the incentive to trust, you reduce the ability to contract, and therefore you reduce the overall um, the overall capacity of society to grow through free exchange. Uh, but but it's, it's a far less clear case than, say, I bash you over the head and you lose your mental capacities for the rest of your life. Uh, the, the way we compensate for this is also less clear. And when you extrapolate uh, out from the basic common law simple situation of, of fraud, uh, selling an odometer where there are a couple of players at, at at issue to a large systematic uh, type of situation like in securities law where you have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of transactions often occurring daily in terms of buying and selling of this stock. And you have companies engaged with thousands, tens of thousands of vendors, of contractors. It becomes a much, much more difficult situation to, to, to comprehend. Uh, similarly, the damages are, are far less clear. If, if you're a diversified shareholder, if, if you do what uh, Professor Painter wishes all the Supreme Court justices would do and just hold mutual funds and you're holding the Vanguard index, holding the entire extended market index, then you're equally likely to be on the buy and the sell side of each transaction. So the need for you to be compensated for any fraudulent behavior is effectively nil unless you're a large hedge fund, a large investor that's taking large risky positions, speculators that are actually driving the market price. It's important to realize that in the terms of class action litigation, which is the dominant form of litigation in this sphere, that the vast majority of the class is someone that really is not injured when you consider them over the long iteration of these behaviors. And the reason, again, that we deter fraud is because of the iteration of the behaviors. Um, Secondly, uh, who's paying? The people who pay for uh, damage and a fraud uh, if, if you are selling a bad car are the people who sell you the car. They book the profit for that car. Who pays in the context of securities litigation? The company. Uh, 
Uh, by and large, this doesn't go through to the actual uh, malfeasors, but in fact, the fictional construct of the company, which is nothing more than an aggregation of individual shareholders, of whom you're likely to be one. You're, if you're a diversified shareholder, you're just as likely to be on the defendant's side as the plaintiff's side. So you really are taking from one group of these shareholders and paying to another group of these shareholders. Therefore, I want to dispel the notion that it, by and large private rights of action for securities litigation are in any way necessary in terms of compensating uh, people who are injured. That's particularly true in light of uh, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which creates a fair funds provision where the SEC can actually go in there. I'm not saying that private rights of action for large individual shareholders don't have merit in some cases, but, but I think it's important to realize that there's substantial over-deterrence being created by the, the scheme as it exists. Um, and the real reason we would have any securities litigation, any private rights of action at all, is due to deterrence. Now, unfortunately, the evidence on this, uh, on, on the effective deterrence, is, is, is very mixed. If, if you look in your packet, the, the first article cited here from Janet Cooper Alexander, the, the seminal article, uh, shows a very lack of correlation between uh, damage awards on the one hand and actual wrongdoing or injury on the other. Uh, some, of, some people would say, well, the SEC really can't uh, enforce all of these uh, wrongdoings that are out there on the market. So we have to have the private actors. But in fact, when you look at the empirical research that, say, Michael Perino has done at St. John's Law School, you find that, uh, in, in fact, uh, over two-thirds of the cases, the plaintiff's lawyers are filing after the SEC is already investigating. So in fact, what they're doing is piggybacking on the regulatory scheme we have getting money in the process, and engaging in this uh, behavior, what I would call predatory behavior to a significant degree on the part of the lawyers, uh, and largely driven by plaintiffs, um, at least historically, that have been either in the pocket of the law firm, i.e., uh, some of the allegations uh, which have now been pleaded guilty to against uh, members of the Milberg Weiss firm, or uh, largely in the pocket of the law firms. On the other hand, uh, even under the 1995 Private Securities Litigation Reform Act, the large shareholder tends to have control of the litigation. The largest shareholder tends to be public pension funds, like the State Employees Retirement Funds uh, in California, New York, or here in Ohio. And those are political bodies which are uh, largely uh, uh, led by boards that are staffed with public employee unions with their own private agendas and or political figures. Uh, in New York, the state comptroller has complete control of it. He happens to get a lot of money from securities lawyers. So, so it's, 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 a, it's a substantial problem with the system. Now, just focusing very briefly on Stone Ridge and why this matters, it's important to realize that you could e e extrapolate uh, uh, potential frauds in a lot of these cases. I see I'm about out of time, so I'm going to wrap this real, qu real quickly. But it, it, the, the case at issue in Stone Ridge, you had uh, $17 million of alleged fraud that was engaged into by Motorola and Scientific Atlanta on a, on a company with $5 billion in annual sales. If you can start going for the deep pockets in these cases, uh, that are not the actual primary issuer, um, then in fact anyone who's doing business with any private company in the United States is going to have to be worried about looking at these accounting issues. I can go into more in detail on this in the question and answer, but they're going to have to be worried about it, and they're going to be potentially uh, on the hook for this, for this large sum of money, which means that there's going to be a substantial premium paid by any company doing business with a U.S. listed company uh, which is going to make U.S. businesses generally more uncompetitive and clearly make U.S. Uh, exchanges more non-competitive, uh, given, given that companies will choose to list overseas where they're not subject to the substantial risk premium that they're going to bear uh, to be listed in a U.S. market. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, thank you, Mr. Copeland. Obviously, I have a different view on the competitive of the U.S. markets and, and the, the compensation and deterrence elements of securities fraud in our country. Um, I think and hope that vendors should be worried about being on the hook, and, and that is, by definition, deterrence, and it's something that's good for our markets. Um, but the policy question is, what happens when there is no private right of action for scheme liability under the securities law? 
And I would ask all of you to think Enron when you're answering this question. What would have happened in Enron if, had there been no private right of action or risk of a private right of action um, under the securities law? Um, approximately 6.9 billion of the 7.1 billion uh, recovered in the private Enron case came from secondary market players. There was nothing left in Enron, obviously, so they had to go somewhere else. Um, if you wipe that out, investors would have been left with the 423 million that the SEC recovered, and that's what, you, if you read the briefs, the briefing um, in this case, you'll say, well, we have the SEC, we have the DOJ, and, and they can do a fine job of compensating investors and creating deterrence in our markets. Um, you can tell me whether you think 423 million is greater compensation and greater deterrence than 7.1 billion. I think the answer is pretty clear uh, that private uh, rights of action create greater compensation, create greater deterrence, and I think those are all great things um, for, our, our, for our markets. <clears throat> There are other examples. Enron's one of obviously the favorites, and we discussed it at length in our brief. But in WorldCom, uh, the SEC fair funds recovered 750 million, and the private class actions recovered 6.1 billion. I mean, these are significant differences, folks. Um, in AOL Time Warner, the SEC recovered 300 million, and the private class actions recovered 2.5 billion. In Bristol Myers Squibb, the SEC recovered. 150 million, and uh, the private class actions recovered 574 million. If you're talking about compensation and deterrence, there's a significant difference here, and I think it's meaningful. <clears throat> Following up on the SEC, if you give SEC exclusive jurisdiction over non-issuer or secondary market or scheme defendants, whatever you want to call them, um, what is the consequence of that, aside from just the difference in what's recovered? Um, one is resources. The SEC has limited resources. And recently, a Government Accountability Office report from August of 2007 highlighted some of those deficiencies that the SEC has and recommended additional actions needed to ensure planned improvements and address limitations in enforcement division operations. Um, Currently, as of 2006, the SEC had 684 investment attorneys, and that, actually, that figure is actually less than 2004 and less than 2005. Um, if we are going to be giving them greater responsibility in this area, um, they should be beefing up operations instead of decreasing them. Um, they are also slow in making distributions. According to this report, over the five-year five period, the SEC had collected or had been a, recovered $8.4 billion since 2002, but it had only distributed $1.8 billion of it. The remaining $6.6 .6 billion is sitting there collecting interest and would much rather be in the hands of the investors that were defrauded. Now, also, interestingly, um, any unclaimed funds are given to the U.S. Treasury. Um, and earlier you, ha you heard Professor Brown talk about um, the, the battle between the different agencies and interests in the federal government as to who would file an amicus brief um, in support of petitioners or respondents, and we all know how that came out. So something interesting for, for everyone to consider. Um, for SEC fair funds in which the SEC is responsible for overseeing distribution, they have to date only distributed 16.4% of the funds they've recovered. Um, I was hoping I could have some figures for you in the private sector to compare, but I could not find that data. Um, with all you academics around, maybe that's something you can look at for comparative purposes. I'm guessing it's significantly higher. Um, I, I don't want to, I really don't have a lot more time to spend on. I mean, I think to me the issue, the policy issues are clear. Um, if you're going to allow the secondary market players to escape liability, um, then we're just, uh, we're not do providing the investors the compensation that security laws were intended to provide. We are not going to deter other players, other vendors. I mean, we discussed a lot of the vendor cases. What message does it send to vendors that uh, go ahead and, and create these sham transactions, um, be clever and crafty about the way that you do it, and then you can retain your billions in profits while other companies go bankrupt?
Um, and I just one other point um, that Mr. Copeland raised and that I saw in the briefing um, about compensation, how basically it's a move from one pocket to the other. That's really not true. Um, though we represent uh, large institutional investors and in state pension funds um, in the state of Ohio, we're also concerned about the small individual investor. In Enron, there were retirees who invested, um, obviously, their whole life savings in Enron. You may say that that's, they're bad for not diversifying, but the fact of the matter is, in Ohio, if we have large companies going under as a result of securities fraud, we want our individual investors to have some kind of recourse. If they cannot go to the secondary market or those who actually worked actively with them and knowingly with them to create sham transactions which destroyed their company, you are telling those people they have nothing. And to me, that's unacceptable. Thank you. Um, I want to shift our attention a little bit to what might happen uh, if the Supreme Court upholds uh, some form of scheme liability uh, in this case. I'm not saying that it's going to. Uh, I'm not saying that it should. I'm just saying what if. Um, and in particular, uh, as the author of The Complete Guide to Sarbanes-Oxley, available at finer bookstores everywhere, um, I want to focus on the Sarbanes-Oxley implications. Now, as most of you probably know, Section 404 of Sarbanes-Oxley uh, imposes an obligation upon the company to annually conduct an assessment of their internal controls over financial reporting uh, and to provide disclosure as to the effectiveness of those controls. Now, of course, it's not the disclosure that's made Section 404 so controversial and so costly. Uh, it is the fact that you have to conduct this assessment to determine the, that your internal controls are effective before saying they're effective. Um, as many of you may know, Section 404 has turned out to be immensely more costly than anyone anticipated. When Sarbanes-Oxley was under consideration, Congress asked the SEC to estimate the annual number of man hours, I guess that's not PC, person hours, it would require the average publicly held company uh, to comply with Section 404. The SEC estimated something on the order of 300 per year. Um, FEI survey indicates it's on the order of something more like 25,000. Um, something to remember the next time somebody tells you government gets it right, uh, they were off by two, count them, two orders of magnitude. Mm -hmm. Now, also relevant to the questions at hand, of course, are sarbanes actually sections 302 uh, and 906, which require the CEO and CFO of the company to individually certify, uh, and in particular under Section 302, uh, require them to certify that the company has effective internal controls. Now, what's going to happen under these provisions in the event that some form of scheme liability is upheld? Well, imagine that your Motorola or some other publicly held vendor who are responsible under Sarbanes-Oxley for preparing your annual 404 assessment. I've talked to a lot of uh, business people uh, in writing the complete guide to Sarbanes-Oxley available finder bookstores everywhere, and one of the things that I discovered was that they've had enormous amounts of difficulty dealing with the problem of creating effective internal controls to relate to vendors. Um, firms have had difficulty getting provisions uh, relating to internal control performance uh, into these contracts. Uh, in particular, even when dealing with core uh, services that have been outsourced, uh, firms often fail to insist uh, on contractual rights to perform internal control auditors uh, at vendors. Uh, and indeed, uh, in many cases, the contract does not even authorize them uh, to request a SAS 70 report. Now, this has meant that uh, developing your internal controls to deal with vendor relations uh, has been a real problem. Firms generally are unable to identify or document, uh, let alone evaluate and assess uh, the internal control processes of their partner firms. 
Well, imagine if scheme liability were to be imposed. The incentive, the liability risk uh, that would be increased is going to create a significantly greater incentive for firms to subject the sort of contracts that were at issue here uh, to their Section 404 internal control procedures. The net effect would be to bring significant pressure on the Motorola's of the world to subject these, these sorts of contracts to effective internal audits. Now the problem, of course, is, is that in a lot of these cases there are going to be plausible stories about why the accounting treatment is appropriate, but nobody's going to want to have uh, to sign off on accounting treatment that might push the edge of the envelope without having both their internal and their external auditors sign off on that treatment. So what we're looking at potentially is the very real possibility that you're going to get external auditors in to sign off on how these contracts are being treated. But who's external auditors? We're not talking about charters external auditors signing off on charters accounting treatment. We're not talking about Motorola's external auditors signing off on Motorola's treatment. That we already have. What we're talking about is the possibility that the Motorola's of the world are going to want their external auditors to sign off on charters treatment of these transactions. Well, you might say, well, so what? Aren't internal controls supposed to crack down on wrongdoing? Well, yes, but your wrongdoing not somebody else's. Remember, Motorola didn't issue the misleading financial statements. It didn't help prepare them. We're not talking about Charter's 404 duties. We're talking about Motorola's. And so we're talking about imposing significantly more expensive and significantly more demanding internal control obligations on firms, particularly in a world where outsourcing has become so common. And there's a reason, after all, that firms seldom put internal control performance provisions in contracts with vendors, suppliers, customers, and service agents. It's bad enough trying to monitor your own internal controls. Trying to monitor somebody else's internal controls is going to be even more expensive and more difficult. Now, Jim Copeland, I think, talked very eloquently about the impact of all of this on U.S. competitiveness. What I want to point out to you is the potential that Stone Ridge has to implicate both areas that seem to have played a significant role in hurting the competitiveness of U.S. capital markets, which is, on the one hand, litigation risk, but on the other hand, the cost of complying with Sarbanes-Oxley. Right? And my point is, is that a, a decision in favor of the plaintiffs in this case raises both of those sets of costs and will make U.S. capital markets even less competitive. Now, this is, of course, policy, and Jay Brown made an interesting observation. I think it was last night at the reception or dinner where he said, well, central bank majority said, don't talk about policy, and then all the court did was talk about policy, right? And, and all the briefs talked about policy. So <laughs> if you want to think policy is relevant, surely this is a relevant policy uh, that ought to be factored in. I want to touch briefly on two final points, and then I'll, I'll conclude. First, I think Richard Painter and Jim Copeland's remarks and, and Andrew's remarks sort of interestingly set up the dynamic on the debate on compensation and deterrence uh, in these cases. And I have to confess that I come down strongly on the side of with my friend Jim Copeland. Um, I think these are simply pocket transfer cases they, they, with um, you know, a percentage going to the lawyers. And, and as a lawyer and instructor of lawyers, I suppose I think that, that that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> but, but I want to briefly mention the, the other thing that's going on here. When we think about tort liability, I learned in law school a long time ago that tort liability has a number of basic purposes, compensation, deterrence, and retributive justice. When we think about who pays, who's going to pay if Motorola and Scientific Atlanta lose this case? Well, Motorola and Scientific Atlanta. Not the people at Motorola and Scientific Atlanta that made the decision uh, 
allegedly, to facilitate charters fraud, but the companies, which means the company is going to have less money. Shareholders as residual claimants, that means that comes out of the shareholder's pocket. It is an innocent party that pays here. And that does not advance the goal of retributive justice. We're dealing with a liability scheme that's fundamentally flawed because it doesn't go after the people who actually committed the wrongdoing. Right? We have to think about changing securities liability to go after the people who actually committed the fraud. Finally, um, I want to uh, pick up on Jay Brown's point about the SG brief. I want to also suggest to you that the Solicitor General's brief is going to be enormously important in this case, but for a rather different reason. Uh, my friend Mitu Gulati and I wrote an article in the Emory Law Journal entitled, How Do Judges Maximize? And it's a story basically about how judges make decisions. And in the course of that article, we argued that the United States Supreme Court is institutionally incapable of deciding securities litigation <laughs> cases. Um, the law clerks typically have not had securities regulation in law school. Um, the justices typically do not come from business law backgrounds. And securities law cases, frankly, are not what get you written up in the history books, right? Pull out books like The Brethren or Super Chief and tell me how many pages are devoted to securities fraud cases. I looked at The Brethren not too long ago, and the only reference I saw to a securities fraud case was in connection with explaining why Brennan agreed with Blackman in one case because he was trying to get Blackman to write Roe v. Wade a certain way. <laughs> this is not cases they care about. They have no institutional reason to care about these cases, and they don't. We said that this is the most significant securities case in a decade. Well, a decade ago, the United States Supreme Court decided a case called United States versus O'Hagan, the insider trading case. Go back and read Justice Ginsburg's opinion in that case. It is a cut and paste pot job where she clipped out key provisions of the government brief, the Solicitor General's brief, reworded a few of them, but for the most part quoted it, right? Um, I assume one of her clerks called up the SG's office and said, it's very nice to have this printed brief, but we need the Word doc copy, <laughs> you know, so we can do some cutting and pasting. And I would be willing to bet, I would be willing to bet that when we see the opinion in this case, it's going to look an awful lot like the Solicitor General's brief. Thank you. All right. Thank you to uh, each of uh, the speakers. In the interest of trying to make this a fair fight, although I uh, was vice president of the Federal Society at Chicago when I was in law school, I have a view on this that more closely coincides with um, the sites. So I'm going to start off the Q&A here with a couple of um, questions of my own. I'm going to direct the first one, I guess, to um, Professor Bainbridge. Um, you talked about the unanticipated cost um, that Section 404 um, um, imposed in order to make sure that companies could certify that they had adequate internal controls. Um, isn't it possible that that suggests we had a bigger problem than we thought? And is it the case we want to abandon that simply because the cost of making sure that we had adequate internal controls was high? Well, the question I think is, is, is a fair one. Um, but the question that we have to try and grapple with is whether um, there really is a correlation between what we're spending on 404 and the uh, existence of internal control difficulties um, and problems under uh, that companies have experienced. It is certainly the case that at many companies internal controls were inadequate. And one of the explanations for why securities filings have been down recently has been that better internal controls has meant that there's been less fraud. 
And so you can make the case for, in that regard, for saying, well, we needed something like 404 to ramp up better internal controls. The problem has been, number one, did we need to spend as much on 404 as we did uh, in order to achieve that result? Number two, do we need the recurring costs? And one of the things you have to remember is that 404 is not simply costly in the first year you're subject to it, but there are massive recurring costs year in and year out for the annual assessment that's required. Um, uh, you know, every year if you use SAP's 404 compliance software, they sell you a new software package and that starts at half a million dollars, right? Um, and so, you know, it, in the cost-benefit analysis, what we're talking about is raising the cost of, of 404, where it's not clear to me that we're going to get much in the way of benefit, because we are, after all, talking about uh, people having to take responsibility for the effectiveness not only of their own internal controls now, but also for looking at how their um, partner firms are accounting for these issues. Which, which brings me to the second question I had for you. It, isn't it the case in, in uh, Stone Ridge, at least, that um, the vendors had to look no further than their own internal controls? Isn't that what we're talking about here is the fraudulent behavior within the vendor, within, within the vendor. In, in other words, was it necessary in this case for Motorola to certify what was going on at Charter? Um, they had to look no further than their own internal agreement um, to, to price these boxes at a price that was in excess of um, uh, what was appropriate. Well, it, it depends, though, on, on whether you believe the second amended complaint I think, um, and I guess there are two responses to that. One is, um, if what you're saying is that liability is going to be only exist where you have the facts as Jay outlined them from the second amended complaint so that, you know, that all you have to do is worry about catching your own internal misconduct, uh, then I think um, you're right. The problem, of course, is, is that the original allegations basically were that, um, that they knew or recklessly uh, should have known uh, about the way Charter was handling its accounting treatment and that they were essentially facilitating Charter's accounting treatment. If that's going to be the touchstone of liability, then you're clearly going to be concerned about Charter's accounting treatment. The other issue that I think is relevant to that analysis is the discussion that we've already had about the incentives to settle these cases, right? Um, because these cases potentially involve such large dollar amounts, I think firms will have to be concerned with not only how they're accounting for these, these transactions, but also looking at how their partner firms uh, are accounting for these transactions. Um, particularly because evidence, when, when the SEC went after AOL, AOL Time Warner in the AOL Time Warner Bertelsmann case, um, they not only went after AOL Time Warner, but they went after Bertelsmann um, based on how AOL Time Warner had accounted for these transactions. And so, you know, there is this potential, uh, I think, that they are going to have to be concerned about the accounting treatment that their partner firms are using. So maybe there's room for a a split in, in the rule depending on whether we're talking about pleading or ultimate liability. Um, I have a couple more, but I'm going to uh, ask, um, open this up for questions either from folks um, uh, viewing on the webcast or here in the room. And, and just as a reminder, again, if you have um, questions that you'd like to email, you can email those to casecblr at gmail.com. Question for all of the panelists. Um, wouldn't it make sense to uh, repeal Section 404 of Sarbanes-Oxley and restore aid or a better liability, uh, perhaps, uh, to uh, revisit the decision that apparently has been made by Congress and the courts to cut back on plaintiffs' rights in civil litigation with the 1995 Act, the 98 Act, and of course all these decisions, and yet, on the other hand, to ramp up regulation 
uh, in ways that are uh, very expensive for business and very difficult to comply with, and 404 probably being the most egregious example. Maybe that trade-off, um, that, that swapping out of uh, civil litigation for regulation has turned out not to be worth it. Should we revisit that issue fundamentally from a philosophical point of view? Um, I would say not in the way you frame it, Professor. <laughs> and, 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 and the reason is I, I'm, I'm, first of all, I think the 95 Act could, could be amended, but I, I think it needs to be amended to, to go further, uh, particularly due to the public pension fund abuse problem I talked about. I, I think the, the pleading standards, I think Barbara and Jay were absolutely correct, the pleading standards are much higher than they used to be. Uh, that doesn't mean that you wouldn't see a lot of parallel litigation in these cases, particularly because the fact pattern of this case sort of sets the template for it. You've got a defendant company and, you, and the company says, well, listen, you know, how about if I settle with you on the cheap and I give you all this information on these other guys you can go after too, and uh, as long as that's sufficient to, to beat the pleading standard, you can generate lots of cases that way. And I, I think that's precisely the behavior you'd see. Um, in terms of the 98 Act, I, I think going back to state courts on these cases would be similar to the class action problem we've, we've seen generally before the Class Action Fairness Act. I think you would see substantial uh, actual race to the bottom behavior going to the, to the most lax uh, states to, to generate this litigation. Um, that being said, I mean, I, I think the policy solution here is precisely the one you would ask as the normal intellectual exercise, saying, uh, you, these, these, these laws are largely designed to protect uh, the shareholders. Granted, some of the shareholders uh, will be foolish. Some of them will rely on fraud. Some of them will invest in pets.com. Some of them will listen to Ken Lay telling them to put their, their pension money all in the, back in the company. Uh, they're, they're two different situations. The, the latter one's one we generally would want to protect in, in that narrow circumstance. The former is one we obviously wouldn't want to protect. Um, but, but I look at this from the standard of, of, of someone raising capital, and what would a company raising capital do? If you gave the company the option to opt out of Sarbanes-Oxley or opt in, or opt in to a lesser form of Sarbanes-Oxley, if you gave the company the option to opt out of securities litigation, opt for arbitration, opt for a lighter form of securities litigation regime or the current regime, what would the individual raising capital do? Realizing that uh, any differential in risk would be priced into the IPO, therefore that any uh, – any, if you if you chose a suboptimal regime, you would lessen the money that flowed into your own pocket. I, I I would bet my entire net worth that you would see almost no one, if not no one, opting for the current regime in terms of Sarbanes, in terms of Sarbanes Oxley for new companies. I think Sarbanes Oxley can be useful for large existing companies, but for new companies uh, and, and certainly the current litigation regime, I don't think there'd be an investment banker advising them to do it. I don't think there'd be a single entrepreneur that opted into it. That in and of itself is the market test to me that shows that our system as it is is fundamentally flawed. Well, I guess he would like complete deregulation and no securities private um, class actions either. And, and then we go back to the day of Enron and WorldCom, um, where we obviously is not acceptable. There's tension between um, going too far and not going far enough, and, and that's where we see uh, where we see things now. Um, but uh, as the state of Ohio, would I be in favor of getting aiding and abetting liability? Um, at the cost of getting rid of the, the compliance cost for 404? Um, it's a very interesting question. Um, I, I would say no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make that bet. I, I think rule uh, 404 has been effective. It's been effective. So do you want to do away with something that's been effective? I would say no. Um, I think there needs to be parameters about aiding and abetting liability to get to those knowing and active, acting, active violations um, that can provide the compensation and deterrence that we would need in the private realm. Um, yeah, I would completely reject, as a policy matter, Richard's proposal. Um, I think you get much more in the way of effective fraud control from internal controls than you do from private party litigation. Um, the deterrent effect of private party litigation we've debated, and I won't rehash that debate, but we know 
right? There's, there's a wealth of studies now which suggest that um, having empowered audit committees, having empowered internal audit uh, has made a significant difference in the quality of financial reporting. Um, and one of the pieces of evidence that we see there is, is if you believe, as I do, that markets generally work, one of the things that's instructive, and, and, and I guess I would disagree a little bit with one of the things Jim said, we observe a lot of closely held businesses and nonprofits more or less voluntarily adopting 404 light. Um, they don't go whole hog, but they adopt internal control regimes because they're benefiting from them. Are there things about 404 that need to be fixed? Sure. Um, I think auditing standard number five, as it comes into play, um, is going to be a significant improvement in terms of reducing um, the fees that external auditors are charging um, in connection with 404. Um, there will be a lot less duplication. Um, they'll be able to rely on, on both internal management things and, and prior year studies. I think that'll help hold down costs significantly. I think the SEC made a fairly serious error in deciding not to scale 404 uh, for smaller uh, businesses, particularly for microcaps. Um, but but uh, if you give me 404 as, as modified by auditing standard number five, and if we scaled 404 so that it was less burdensome for microcaps, I would much rather have 404 than have, um, you know, I would say give me 404 and disimply 10b-5 and I'd be a very happy camper. <laughs> I, I could endorse that policy proposal. Um, it, it, I also want to just, just it, it's important to, to comment on the aiding and abetting liability. I mean, it, it, the problem here is is precisely not that there's no deterrence, but that there's the scope for substantial over deterrence under, under general joint and several liability problems. I mean, here you've got a $17 million total transaction. Um, imagine when you've got billions of dollars of losses, the exposure that you're subjecting potential vendors to, it's, it's really mind-boggling the amount of over-deterrence you could have, which is, which is why it's a particularly bad idea, I think, given the way the plaintiff's bar works in this area. So the private securities uh, law reform uh, uh, imposition of proportionate liability would not apply? Is that what you're, you're saying? Cause I'm saying that the risk would be substantial and the settlement value would exceed the, the potential actual value. All right. Do we have uh, another, another question from the audience here? Yes. Yes, Professor uh, Bainbridge. Sorry. <laughs> <coughs> Professor Bainbridge, you painted the picture of the unfortunate shareholders of a company, publicly traded company, that is caught committing fraud. When the company that's caught committing fraud has to pay a judgment or pay a settlement, it comes out of the shareholders, innocent shareholders' pockets, you pointed out. Uh, is not that an argument that could be made against criminal liability as well? Anytime a company commits a crime and is you know, sanctioned with a fine, civil penalty, criminal fine, uh, it comes out of the pockets of the innocent shareholders. And doesn't the argument therefore prove far too much? Um, it, it, yes and no. Um, it, it certainly... What you're getting at is, is that, as you probably know, there's a very active debate in the academic literature about entity liability and enterprise liability, um, both civilly and criminally. Um, I happen to be one of those that believe that we've made a fundamental error uh, in our policies in both the criminal and civil law with respect to enterprise issues. Um, uh, the Baron Thurlow famously said, um, you know, how do you expect to punish, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically, how do you expect to punish a corporation when it has no soul to be damned, no body to be kicked? Um, it, it seems to me that, that if you're concerned about criminal conduct and, and within the confines of a corporation, that both in terms of deterrence and in terms of retributive justice, that the appropriate people to be held liable are not the entity, but the people within the entity who made the decisions that led to the entity committing a criminal act. And, and I've maintained for 10 or 15 years in, in various writings that, that we need to rethink the whole question of enterprise liability 
to focus on the agents of the corporation who commit crime or commit fraud as opposed to the entity because precisely because punishing the entity ends up punishing people ends up punishing the wrong people and both from a deterrence and a retributive justice perspective um, I think enterprise liability is very difficult to justify I think that you know the um, the what happened to Dennis Kozlowski I'm not sure he should be in a maximum security prison <laughs> you know um, which in New York was the only option given his sentence but I think you know sending Dennis Kozlowski to jail is absolutely the right thing to do I think sending Jeff Skilling to jail is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, I'm not sure holding Tycho responsible for what Kozlowski did would have been the right thing to do if they had done that. But, but, but we are talking about a, from, from, from your perspective, a wide-ranging repeal of corporate liability for crimes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I don't have any bones about that. Yeah, I, I would just as leave. I think I think the whole idea of corporate criminal liability is is fundamentally flawed, and I understand that that's not the direction we've been moving. Certainly, the federal government has been ramping up corporate criminal liability, but but both from a moral perspective of retributive justice and from an efficiency perspective of deterrence, I think that 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 we really ought to be focusing on people, right? You know. Okay, I I, I thank you for your clarification. I've got another question on the um, argument about taking money out of one pocket and putting it into the other pocket on the assumption that shareholders have very diversified portfolios. Uh, I worked for three years at a large corporate firm in Los Angeles, and it's my impression that there's much more litigation between and among uh, publicly traded corporations than there is between shareholders and publicly traded corporations. Now, if there are two publicly traded corporations suing one another, it seems to me that you would make the same argument, that because people hold diversified portfolios, that it's a waste of time and waste of assets for companies to be allowed to sue one another. Would you take your argument there? No. Um, and let me explain why. Um, when a company sues another company, I mean, there what you're doing is, is saying there's an actual wrong here. In other words, my set of shareholders here has been wronged by that set of shareholders here. Now, if you're just talking about it from a, a static equity point of view, then the answer would have been yes. But the point is, is we have the framework, the rule of law, precisely designed so that uh, you want to deter company A from misbehaving. If company A is cheating company B, you want to deter them. The problem here is that a lot of the, a lot of the argument uh, rests on this compensatory notion uh, and, and it really should flow. I mean, you're talking to someone who doesn't think that the compensatory notion is good for much in tort law generally. So, so I, I mean, I think you always focus on the deterrence notion. I think that, that, that Charles Freed uh, was largely right in the monograph he wrote for AEI. I mean, I, I think re the, the, the retribution notion is an interesting notion. I think it's, it's, it's debatable, although in this context I, I don't think it's debatable. I think Steve's absolutely right. Um, but But... It's, it's a very different situation here, I mean, from the situation where company A is actually wrong company B. Here what you're talking about is company A has wronged a subset of company A, uh, and it's not clear that company A did it. It's, it's that someone who did something wrong who works for company A did it. Uh, the, the, the point that I'm making is, is that because this compensation doesn't make any sense from a shareholder perspective, it's a shareholder suing the company that the shareholder holds or held shares in, because, because the, the, it doesn't make any sense from the shareholder perspective, uh, then the only argument you're going to fall back on would be a, either a retribution argument that Steve's talked about or a deterrence argument, and the deterrence arguments really start to fall apart. Not that there's no deterrence. I mean, clearly the threat of securities litigation it generates lots of incentives, but the deterrence doesn't match up very well with what's being deterred. And that, in fact, what we see is that uh, these, these are typically piggyback notions on the SEC. And you know, the, the argument uh, presented uh, by Andrea sort of is, well, on, on the one hand, you, know, 
the shareholders got all this money back, this extra money back they wouldn't have gotten. Well, to me, that's that's a nonsensical argument because if if shareholders are diversified, you know, they're they're taking it from other diversified shareholders. Now, if it's a deterrence point of view, that's a that's a different function. But it's it's not clear to me that 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 deterrence is actually working in any efficient way. In fact, I think. Um, you see quite quite the op the evidence goes the other direction. I mean, you see capital fleeing from this regime. I think we may have a question maybe from uh, somebody viewing on the webcast. Yeah. Well, there's a question uh, Mr. Couple mentioned before the, the competitiveness issue, and there's a question about how is the liability regime meaningfully different in in foreign markets that are where companies are are, are relisting or could relist or, or engage in joint listings. I mean, essentially, you don't have these rights. I mean, that, that, that's, that's the short answer, is, is, is essentially what, what we have in terms of, of U.S. shareholder litigation is, is by and large not seen in these foreign markets. Um, in terms of regulation, the regulations are going to vary abroad. Uh, clearly nothing as onerous as, as uh, what you see with Sarbanes-Oxley. So um, there are pros and cons to that. Uh, I mean, I think historically, um, you know, our markets, the, the, the net positives outweigh the net negatives. I, I think there have always been significant costs since private rights of action were implied. And, and, and realize, I'm not saying there should be no enforcement of fraud provisions here, but since the private rights of action have been implied, and really since, uh, you know, Mel Weiss and, and Bill LaRock, et cetera, developed this sort of model uh, for enforcing those private rights of action, I think there have always been serious costs, but I think that the depth and breadth of U.S. capital markets uh, and and the, the the experience that you had here with the interpretation of the rule and law was sufficiently robust that it outweighed any of the costs of that regime. I, obviously, the market's speaking now, and that doesn't appear to be the case anymore. If I could just follow up on that, um, so the curiosity, I mean, is, is is it your sense that the difference is a substantive, more substantive one about the what the standards for liability are, or procedural in terms of whether or not there are private rights of action, and also perhaps, as I think Professor Painter mentioned before, the fact that at least in European markets, for example, you're going to have a loser pays rule for litigation, where litigation is. I mean, is it a, is it a difference in the, in the procedural di rules about how one would advance certain claims for liability, or is it just that there's very little liability or very little non- governmental uh, enforcement for these sorts of actions? That's an interesting question, and I'm not sure I know with specificity the answer, except to know that this litigation doesn't occur in these foreign markets. Now, now clearly the loser pays provision, I think, uh, is something that uh, – it's something we, we've been talking about at the Manhattan Institute for a long time. It's something we're looking at now. It's something that I think in, in, in part could make a big difference here in the U.S. Now, with this securities litigation – uh, situation, it would drive out some of the most vexatious types of it. Now, I, now, my sense is how much more would it drive out that wasn't driven out by the 95 Act? You know, I don't know. Um, in, in fact, it's sort of the interim effect of these suits, the massive risk of, of completely capsizing the corporation, the incredible stock price pressure put on continuing headlines, etc., that, uh, that drives a lot of these towards uh, inevitable settlement. So I, I'm not sure that loser pays would, would fix it. I, I think it would be a step in the right direction, particularly if it was I mean, if it was an assignable interest, an insurable interest, or clearly these large players, the former Miller Weiss firm, uh, the successor firm that Bill LaRock started, and, and, and some of the folks that have gobbled up the old Miller Weiss attorneys, and they, they clearly could uh, self insure uh, across a lot of these cases given the amount of capital that they have and that they've made and raised. Well, you know, you've got loser pays in most of these other major capital centers. Um, in many of them, uh, you don't have contingent fee litigation. Um, in many of them, you, have, you don't have anything remotely resembling the panoply of implied private rights of action that we have in the United States. You have statutory rights of action that are even more limited than the express rights of action under the 33 and 34 Acts. Um, uh, in in uh, Germany, I believe, for example, um, you have to have actual eyeball reliance um, in, in order to, for, to bring these cases. Um, in many of these uh, jurisdictions, you don't have sort of easy class action procedures right. the way we do. Um, in many of them, you have social norms uh, about bringing litigation. 
and so you have this totality of, of both procedural, substantive, and legal um, normative, rather, uh, constraints. Uh, in a number, um, Jim mentioned that China had caught us, which I was not aware of. I think that's probably largely a function of their economy right. and improved transparency. But um, very interestingly, uh, in China, they do have private securities litigation now. Hmm. But in order to sue, uh, before you can bring a private lawsuit, you have to essentially have the government authorize your suit. Um, there has to be some sort of affirmative government action authorizing your suit. And, and I had a student write a uh, research paper for me last year in which she suggested that um, a reform she thought we ought to have here in the United States would be um, uh, to have the SEC give uh, a right to sue letter uh, before private parties could uh, could bring a, a, a private right of action. Uh, I'm not sure that's a good idea. Um, I'm not sure it's either necessary nor advisable, uh, but it was an interesting uh, uh, factor. And it may be that in China, much of uh, <laughs> much of the government's uh, in the pocket of uh, corporate interest anyway. So, uh, well, and so very often, of course, the government would be about. authorizing yeah. to sue itself, since right. most of these were, <laughs> you know, the government's still the majority shareholder in most of these companies. If I may, I, Chairman Cox earlier this year was when, be, when being pushed about maybe we, it's time to take a uh, take Sarbanes Oxley back and talking about the competitive competitiveness of the U.S. market said we are the envy of the world. Other nations are modeling um, their regulatory practices after us. We are the standard, and uh, we are still the envy of the world. And taking that away, I, I don't know if that's the direction we want to go. I am proud that we um, have a strong securities fraud system in the United States, not only with the SEC's um, prosecution authorities, but the private bar being able to act as private attorneys general, and I think it's very effective. And, I, and so I wouldn't agree that we would want to go in that direction. I'd also like to touch, touch on vexatious litigation. We also have here in the United States checks on that. There is Rule 11. There are fairness hearings when there, these settlements um, take place to make sure that the terms are fair that the amounts aren't excessive, that attorneys um, are not being overcompensated for the work that they did in prosecuting those cases. Um, those are areas where we can address some of the concerns that you have and probably aren't fully utilized to the extent they should be. All right, we're out of time. Um, um, do, do, agree with you on that. do you want to take one more question? Or? Okay, we'll take one there in the back. Insofar as this panel is talking about policy, it seems that one of the major issues in policy that hasn't been discussed is institutional competence. It seems that this question uh, 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 was debated by Congress as to whether or not to grant a private right of action. They rejected that proposal expressly and gave the authority to the SEC to do this. And so insofar as we're making arguments that, in fact, pri there should be these private right of actions, we're saying that the court should be second-guessing the congressional judgment on that particular question. And so it seems that since we've got an established rule and we're trying to change the rule, the onus must be upon the petitioners to prove why it is that the current rule is unworkable. Now, the evidence that I've heard presented is, all right, well, let's look at the examples of Enron in terms of the available deterrence. All right, well, let's look at the example of Enron. Let's look at Arthur Anderson. It no longer exists. So the question, I suppose, in terms of deterrence is, one, one, you need to look at the question of institutional competence. I think there's a, there's a serious question as to whether or not it should be the role of the court when they're cutting and pasting briefs, uh, whether or not they should be, you know, second-guessing congressional judgments on this. But second, in terms of deterrence, at what point is it too much deterrence? I mean, we've, we've issued the death sentence for Arthur Anderson. That's not enough. At what point is deterrence too much? And how is it that we should gauge the adequate level of deterrence in these questions? I'll be very brief. I, I think <laughs> that when Congress uh, allowed the SEC to go after people who assist securities fraud and did not, in doing so, overturn Central Bank with respect to the implied private right of action, that ought to make this case a slam dunk for the defendants. Um, you know, the, the 
in terms of institutional competence, even if you think, which I don't, but even if you think that courts are institutionally competent to create implied private rights of action, when you have a clear congressional signal like this, I don't see how the court can, as a matter of, of separation of powers and, and institutional competence, uh, say, well, we're just going to create secondary liability uh, for private parties when Congress clearly could have done so and clearly chose not to. And, and I think that's precisely how they're going to rule. I think, I think they're going to rule five to three on precisely those narrow grounds. I think they're going to say that, uh, you know, we spoke in Central Bank, Congress acted, they could have created an express private right of action here. They didn't. End of story. And I think it's going to be that simple, and that's going to be what they say. I don't think Central Bank held there's no secondary liability. In fact, um, Bar uh, Ms. Uh, sorry, Ms. Black explained that they said there's no aiding and abetting liability, but secondary market players can and should be held liable in appropriate circumstances. This question, the question now is, what are those appropriate circumstances? And although um, it doesn't sound like many people think there's hope for my, my side to prevail, I believe that if there's acting, active and knowing um, participation in a scheme to defraud where these vendors and these secondary people, their in principal purpose and effect in engaging in a transaction is to defraud investors, they should be held liable. And we'll leave it on that note. Um, uh, <laughs> Professor Adler has a couple of uh, brief announcements and we'll uh, adjourn to eat. Yes, thank you. Uh, we're going to uh, take a, a slightly longer break this time. Uh, there will be box lunches available in the atrium, which is essentially on the other side of this wall. People are, are welcome to bring them back into here to eat or, uh, since I believe it's a nice day out, uh, into the law school courtyard. Uh, we'll be adjourning until 12.15. Uh, one reason for that, if people are wondering why we're having a longer break, is Ohio CLE rules require that if we're going to give you CLE credit, we can't count any of the time. We have to leave a, a half an hour of non-program time if, if we're feeding you. So um, uh, to comply with Ohio CLE rules, um, and since we are feeding you, we will adjourn to 12.15, at which point we will right. reconvene uh, for a, a debate between two attorneys that were involved in amicus briefs in this case to debate the merits of Stone Ridge. Uh, I think it'll be a, a fitting and, and very exciting uh, capstone to uh, today's program. So I, I certainly hope to see you all back here at 12.15 for that debate. And please join me for, for thanking our panelists.